right, good morning. Have a question for you as we get rolling this morning. Have any of you ever faced a difficult situation in your life? Any of you ever pray in the midst of that difficult situation? Any of you ever wonder what took God so long to show up in the midst of that challenging situation? Right, it doesn't like not new for for us, right? It's not new for the people of God to find ourselves in times where it's challenging, it's difficult, asking this question of, of God, where are you? And maybe for you, you're in that spot. Maybe right now you're facing some relational challenge or some problem or uh, maybe financial challenge or maybe thinking about just our country and the political climate that we're in and in voting season or uh, maybe thinking about next month is Pride Month and there'll be things pushed in our face that do not line up with the, the values of our God. And right, just so many different things that kind of go, God, where, where are you? And, and how do we seek you? And, and how do we be a part of what you're doing? Well, some of what we're going to be processing today. Today we're going to be in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be looking at the life of Hannah. So if you have a Bible or Bible app, you can go ahead and turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. But before we jump in, start reading there. Uh, we're in week two of our series, Strength and Dignity. Last week, Jim kicked it off uh, going through Proverbs 31. Uh, Proverbs 31 is the end of the book of Proverbs. Right? We're celebrating moms last weekend and celebrating uh, just really godly uh, women in the Bible and godly characteristics. And, and Proverbs 31 is just this kind of list of this uh, character traits uh, of really for women and really for men and women to be striving towards to be about the things of God. And within there, there's a, a verse that describes kind of this virtuous and capable wife uh, as one that has clothed herself in strength and dignity, that she has a, an inner strength and an ability to endure, to, to, to be strong, not just in physical strength, but in who she is, and then to do that in a way that is honorable, that, that points back to her God. And so we're trying to go, man, let's look at uh, different uh, women in the Bible to go, one, how do we be uh, a, a church that celebrates God's example of, of womanhood, right? We're in a, in a time in our culture where there's many voices trying to go, this is what a woman is, this is what a man is. We're going to know what, is, what does God say, uh, what does this look like, and again, what are those attributes that go with that. But then also, what can, what can we learn from their example? So we're going to do week two today, and we're going to wrap it up uh, next weekend looking at the, the life of Deborah. But today we're going to do uh, Hannah, and she's found in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And before, again, before we read, just a little picture of where we are in the arc of what God is up to in his story and history. I'm going to jump to, to Moses, right? Moses is the prophet that God used to help bring his people out of Egypt when they were in slavery there. And through Moses, God gave, the, gave us the first five books of the Bible. And within there is how God created the world and then uh, laws and just um, kind of how to relate to God, how, how are God's people to, to interact. And then as Moses has been leading people out of Egypt through the, the desert, he brings them to the promised land that God has for them, this, this gift for them. And uh, Moses kind of does a, a baton handoff to Joshua, who becomes the leader going into the promised land. The book of, of Joshua follows uh, those first five books, and it's when really God's people are, are taking over that land. Then the next book of the Bible is Judges. Judges is a time where they're in the promised land. They're in where God has been leading them. And uh, within the, the book of Judges is this cycle of people going, wow, God, look how much you've provided for us. You're so good. Then they get really distracted by all the ways that God has provided for them and they forget about him. They start to do their own thing. And then God allows them to be uh, oppressed and have, face enemies and get into a hard place where they go, oh God, we need you to save us. God, we're in this hard spot. And so God uh, rises up these judges or these leaders to help deliver the people. And, and the end of the book of Judges, so that, that pattern kind of repeats over and over again. The end uh, of that book ends with this verse in, in chapter 21, verse 25. And it says that in those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Right, this, this sense of, okay, God, God has shared his, his law, his heart. And there are times where people, they are, they're just doing whatever they think is best. Following the book of Judges is the book of Ruth, where we have a, a great example of another godly woman who loves God. And she's actually not an Israelite, she's a foreigner, but she comes to know God and, and honors him with, with her life and gets to be a part of really what God is doing and bringing his Messiah, Jesus, into this world. And then we get to the book of 1 Samuel. And so Samuel is actually going to be the, the last uh, judge of the nation of Israel. He's the one, the prophet that God uses to set up the first king and the second king, David, uh, and kind of the shift in how God is operating. So we're going to find ourselves kind of in that time of the judges, 
where the people were kind of scattered a little bit, and there's some inconsistency of the nation following after God. We're going to start in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, There was a man named Elkanah who lived in Ramah in the region of, of Zuf in the hill country of Ephraim. And he was the son of Jeraham, son of Elihu, son of Tuhu, son of Zuf of Ephraim. Did you catch all of that? Like you're like, oh, that was so good. I wanted to read that. I think it's really important that we don't skip that. Sometimes for me when I read those, I'm just like, wow, that is so boring and all those names. I don't even know. But for me, it's this reminder that the Bible is a historical document and that we're reading a portion of the Bible that is history, that these are, are real people from real places. And, and that when we come to the scripture, it's just remi- like, man, we could go to this place. It's on this earth, right? The Bible is not uh, a book of fables and stories. No, it's God interacting with people throughout history. Right, so often people are going, man, I'll believe God's real if he'll just interact with me, if he'll just kind of show himself. And the reality is God has done that for, for thousands of years and it's recorded throughout the Bible of God interacting with people, having that recorded so we know what kind of God he is, how he interacts with uh, those that, that choose to follow him and those that choose to reject him. Right, and so we're coming to this to go, okay, God, how do we be your people? Right, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right, he doesn't change. I believe as we look at this text, we're going to see that we as people, right, our, our nature, it doesn't change. And we need, uh, we need God to change who we are. So as we look at this life of Hannah, I believe that we'll be able to see some qualities within her that are worth us following after. To go, God, could you do that in me? God, I, I want to be used as you used Hannah. I want to be a part of what you're doing in this world. So I get there, again, verse 1, we got Elkanah. And I kind of like uh, his name, right? I think his parents were from a region like ours that had elk. And so they were like, Elkanah. All right, all right, let's go into verse 2. So Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah did not. All right, got to pause her again. Uh, he had two wives. So again, we're reading uh, history. That, uh, when we read the Bible, we need to know what kind of genre of literature we're reading, right? The Old Testament has different parts that are, are poetry, that uses a, a lot of imagery. There are other parts that are law that are just saying, hey, this is how we're to live other parts are history. We're just describing what was happening, not prescribing how we're to live. So he's just saying, hey, this guy had two wives. It's not a text that says, y'all need to have two wives. No, uh, this is not like a, a, a approval of sister wives. Uh, That's not what's happening here. And actually throughout the Old Testament, um, there, I can't think of one example where it worked well for those that had multiple wives. Like it was never good. And in the New Testament, right, we see in the New Covenant, right, it's very clearly in Scripture to be a husband and a wife. Just the two of them, no extras. Sound good? I feel like we covered a lot of ground this morning so far. <laughs> no sister wives. Okay. All right, here we have uh, Elkanah. He has two wives, and we see kind of the, this contrast, right? Peninnah has kids, Hannah does not. We're going to kind of continue to see some more contrast as we go. Verse 3. It says, each year Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heaven's armies at the tabernacle. And the priests of the Lord at that time were two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas. Uh, we're not going to meet those two characters till later in chapter 2. But really the, the writing here is setting up a, another contrast. So we're going to see Elkanah and his family. They are people that are, are choosing to love God. Right? There's the time of the judges where people are really inconsistent. And these priests, these sons of Eli, are described in chapter 2 as definitely not walking with the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. Jumping down even further in verse 22 of chapter 2, it talks about how they were sleeping with uh, some of the, the temple assistants there, taking advantage of their role uh, of these young gals. Right? These are, are not guys walking with God. But then contrast that to Elkanah, who's who's traveling, he's bringing his family, they're kind of uprooting for this journey to come and to be able to worship God and to be about the things of God. Let's go back to chapter 1, verse 4. So on the days that Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Peninnah and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So Peninnah would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. And year after year it was the same. Peninnah would taunt Hannah so as they went to the tabernacle, and each time Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. 
Right? We see this family, again, a family that is choosing to, to worship together, to come together, prioritizing the things of God. And I think for us, again, thinking about on that front end, right, that reality that we can be facing difficulties and challenges uh, even as we're seeking to serve the Lord. Right? And, and Hannah coming to this place to, to worship God becomes this place of pain and this reminder of, of kind of, God, where are you and, and why aren't you working? Right, this reality she was faced with, this infertility, that she wasn't able to have kids. And, and in that time, it's important for us to understand just some of the, the cultural context. When a woman wasn't able to have uh, kids back then, it was just seen uh, most often as a, a judgment from God. That God is disapproved with you and he is judging you. And this is the way he's telling you that there's some part of your life that's not in line with him. And, and so he's not giving you children. So for her, she would be bearing that weight of people just going like, what's wrong with you? Why, why won't you just choose God? And yet we're going to see here as we continue through this text that she is a woman that loves God. This is not about God's judgment. Another kind of cultural piece, piece that's important to understand is that for uh, women back there having the kids, the kids were the way that uh, people were cared for as elders, right? There weren't facilities and, and places that they could go to get help in their old age. No, their kids did that. And so again, for her, there, as she looked into her future, there was no one there that would be there to take care of her. She didn't have any kids. And the text says that the, the Lord kept her from having children. And again, this is a reminder of historical perspective. It's just describing what happened. This isn't saying that every time somebody struggles with infertility, that God is the cause of that. That's not true. Right? The reality, we live in a broken world, right? Where sin has corrupted us spiritually, but also physically, Right? Our bodies do not always work how they were designed to work. And I think it's important that we have, just again, feel some of the weight of what Hannah was feeling when it comes to, to infertility. I know even and for many women today, it's right, still a struggle and difficult. Right? Last weekend was, was Mother's Day weekend where we get to celebrate. We love moms. We are thankful for our moms. But I know for some women, it's their least favorite holiday of the year. Because it's a reminder for them that they can't have kids. That's part of my wife and I's journey. When we were newly married, we, we had our plan. and We thought how it would go in, in having kids, and, and it didn't happen. We had, we had a hard time getting pregnant, and then when we did get pregnant, we would lose those kids. And that got, happened over and over again to where Mother's Day was uh, a Sunday that my wife did not want to come to church. Be reminded that uh, we couldn't do that. That wasn't a part of our story yet. And, and so painful, so difficult and, and I have a picture here to share just kind of some of the weight of what does that, what does that feel like to be someone that, that struggles with infertility or that's had kids and lost them. And this is a, a picture we really relate to. This isn't a picture of us, but it's really kind of like of our family. We have, we, we blessed, we journeyed through that infertility. We're, man, we feel so blessed. We have three girls, but we also have three kids waiting for us in heaven. Right, this, we, we believe as Christians, right, that life begins at conception, that those are lives that God designed, that they are, are people that matter, and one day we'll get to meet them. And that journey for us, right, it was painful and hard and difficult. I know for others, like, they don't, didn't get to even have their own kids. But it, it was a, a time that reminded them that we need the Lord. We need to, to be reflecting his heart in the, in the midst of, of the situations we find ourselves in. And it impacted, it changed us. But I no longer ask uh, married couples when they're having kids. Because we got asked that so many times, and, and the pain behind that answer, we just got tired of giving it. We even heard people in that journey tell us that, that maybe this was a sign that God was telling us that we weren't fit to be parents. That this was some of his judgment for us. That he, he was really watching out for kids to not give them to us. And, and we were involved in, sorry. We were involved in youth ministry at that time and faithfully serving God and wondering, God, why aren't you working? What are you, what are you doing? Even having, having kids out of wedlock, not walking to the Lord, able to get pregnant. We're not able to be like, God, what's up with this? And I think for Hannah, she experienced a lot of those same things of, of people going, hey, from our perspective, it seems like something's wrong with you. God's not working. There's no blessing. And I'm sure she had times just like we had times to go, God, where are you? Why so much pain? Why won't you come through? Why won't you work? Right? I think we all can relate to those times in our lives where we're just wondering, God, when are you, 
When are you going to show up? I thought you were good. I thought you were kind. Like, I thought you, you were a loving God. But we're going to see in Hannah that she did not give in to the, the, the pressure of that difficult situation, but she endured. She looked to the Lord, right, that she was truly a woman of strength and dignity. Let's uh, continue on. Let's go into verse 7. I kind of like, or verse 8. Going from 6 and 7, right, this reminder of this pain, this difficulty. There was a year after year experience for her being rubbed in her face. So she's coming to worship God, seeking to be God's woman, and yet facing this difficulty. And I love in verse 8, almost kind of a little bit of humor as we read here, where it says, that, uh, coming to her husband, Elkanah, he says, why are you crying, Hannah? Why are you eating? Why are you downhearted just because you have no children? I love it, like typical guy right here. You have me. Isn't that better than 10 sons? Like, I love it. He's like, babe, I don't get what's going on. Like, you're crying. Like, I don't get the big deal. Especially when, look at the package you got to do life with. I, I can kind of relate to this guy where I'm just like, oh, my wife's struggling. Don't you worry, babe. I'm here for you. I'm going to solve all of your problems. That is not true. <laughs> and she can attest to that. Right, but this can so be our nature that, that uh, even for husbands, right, that when our wives struggle, we go, if just, we can be the quick fix. Hey, just look at it from this perspective or just, right, see this. And we're missing the bigger picture of, of what God is doing. But I love that, that Hannah doesn't give in. She doesn't give him a hard time. Uh, I love that he is a little clueless, uh, like some of us at, at times. But let's jump down to verse 10 to kind of see how, how she continues to respond. Verse 10, it says, Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, I will give him back to you. And he will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to you, his hair will never be cut. Right, so in the midst of her pain and her anguish, she makes this prayer and, and kind of this, this vow to God. God, if you will do this, if you will give me a son, I will give him back to you. And, and again, right, this, we kind of get a sense from the text that this is maybe the first time she's praying this prayer. Probably not the first time she was praying based on her, her circumstance, right? This was a year after year occurrence of coming in to worship God and, and having to be rubbed in her face that she had no kids. But now she gets to the point where she prays and asks God very specifically for a son. But now that she could keep that son, but that she would be able to give that son back to him, to, to worship him in that way. And I think a good reminder for us that this reminder that, that God often is delaying maybe in our life, in our, when we're praying and asking him to work, just kind of curious if the delay in her life had to do with maybe shifting her prayer from just being about what she would get out of the answer to a place where she would pray, God, not just what I get, but I would have it be about you. I think sometimes God delays in our life to get us to a place where our prayers shift from just being about how they could be helpful for us they could turn to be a blessing to others. Well, let's see as she continues. So she's, she's praying. Let's see what happens here in verse 12. So as she's praying to the Lord, Eli, right, he's, he's the priest. He watched her and seeing her lips moving, but hearing no sound, he thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk? He demanded, throw away your wine. Oh no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged and I'm pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I am a wicked woman for I've been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. Well, in that case, Eli said, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she explained. And then she went back and began to eat again and she was no longer sad. All right, so here she is praying, pouring her heart out to the Lord and we got another guy kind of being a typical guy going, hey, from the outside, I think I have enough information to be able to come to an accurate conclusion. All right, he jumps in and just accuses her of being drunk. Probably more has to do with his own kids than her. Right, but he, but he accuses her. How many of you love to be falsely accused? You just love it? In your distress, in your pain, in your difficulty for just somebody to, to make a bunch of assumptions and jump in and just attack your character? Anybody? You're like, ah. Oh. I don't know about you, but when that happens for me, right, I'm, I'm tempted to do a couple different things. One, to just totally ignore them. Two, punch them. <laughs> Or three, attack back. And I, I, and I find her response to be such a great godly response. 
right? She speaks up. She doesn't just ignore him and blow him off, right? She's not just like, oh, uh, right? Sometimes there can be this picture of uh, the humble woman is, is like a doormat. No, that is not a godly woman, right? She doesn't just like roll over. No, she speaks her mind, but she does it obviously in such a way that it persuades him by the end to, to fully bless her request, he has no idea what she is praying, but she, he just, based on how she interacts with him and shares her heart and what's happening, he shifts and just, man, would God grant you the request you have? I think a great reminder for us that when we're maybe in a difficult spot and maybe people jump in, make some conclusions, they don't come in curious and asking questions, but they attack. And how can we be like Hannah and respond really well to, to speak from our perspective but to do that with a humility, with a kindness, not with a sharp tongue, not to, to tear them down, right? She could have so easily like flipped this right back on Eli and, and his sons and just get, got him, but she doesn't do that. Humbles herself, states her case, and God blesses her, right? He, he prays for her that she would have the request that she's asking, and then keep continuing on, verse 19. It says, And the entire family got up early the next morning, went to worship the Lord once more, and then they returned home to Ramah. And when Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea. And in due time, she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel. It's a great name, by the way. Samuel, for he said, I asked the Lord for him, or asked of the Lord. In the Hebrew, it sounds like kind of asked of God. Right? It's just this reminder that God hears us when we pray, right? She has this reminder. She's in this time, like years, right? Year after year, they would come to the temple. Then this pain and this difficulty, questioning probably, God, where are you? What are you doing? Why is it so difficult? And, and people having their, their judgments and their perspectives coming after her. But she writes, she prays, she comes to the Lord, she, she chooses him. And then when her son comes, she's this reminder, man, God answers prayer. God heard me. God saw me. That whole time, he was there. Right, we get this encouragement in Psalm 34, 17. It says that the Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. Jesus reminds us of this in Matthew 7, when he says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds and to everyone who knocks the door will be opened. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Well, of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Right, Jesus is reminding us of a couple of things in prayer. One, that prayer is a process, right? He says, keep on asking, keep on seeking, like keep in your pursuit of the things of God. Right? Don't give up when you just aren't hearing an answer or, or uh, you're not sure what God is up to. Right? He says, keep at it. And then this reminder, though, that God is good. That he is a good father. That he, he desires to give good gifts to his kids. And this doesn't mean that prayer is like a magic formula, like, like God is just some genie in a bottle that you just, get a, uh, just keep saying one thing and then God does it for you. No, he's a, a good father. And sometimes good fathers say no to their kids. Reminded one time when, when our kids were really young, I remember asking them what they wanted to eat the next day. Like, hey, what do you want to eat? And they were like, well, for breakfast, we would like to have ice cream. And then for lunch, we would like to have ice cream so that when we get to dinner, we can have ice cream. Right? And as a good father, I was like, well, absolutely, whatever you want, whatever makes you feel good. <laughs> no, not, not at all. Right? It's like, no, that's a terrible idea. No. And sometimes that's how it is when we pray to God, right? We have things that we're asking God, and we think from our perspective, God, this seems like a really good thing. Would you just do this? And he says, no. Right? Or, or in Hannah's case, it's like not yet, right? There's years of waiting, and then there's an answer. Right? Again, maybe the situation you're in, the difficulty you're in, whether it's, again, a, a relationship or maybe a kid that's far from the Lord or whatever it is. And maybe you've been praying and seeking the Lord and examining yourself and, and going, man, God, is there some area of my life? Like, what, what is it? Why won't you come through in a way that I, I, I thought you would? Right? But there's this encouragement. Keep seeking. God is good. 
But I also like this reminder in James chapter 4, this reminder that kind of James kind of writes to rebuke the church a little bit of, man, sometimes we are the problem in our prayer life. He says this uh, in James 4 towards the end of, of verse 2. He says, you don't, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. So we're like, problem number one, he's saying, hey, you don't even pray and talk to God about the things that are going on in your life. But then verse 3, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure, right? It's all about you. Right? And I'm thankful that God has a bigger perspective, that sometimes he says no or not yet. Right? I even think about Jesus, right, before going to the cross and he's in the garden, he's praying and he's just in, in anguish going, man, Father, if there's any other way, can we do this any other way? He doesn't want to do it, but, the, right, but he ends with it, but not what I want, but what you want. And the Father doesn't change his mind, he continues on and Jesus goes to the cross. Right, his answer to prayer was, yeah, it's not, not going to be the way you want. And I think right, even for the disciples that were there, right, they were so confused about how God was working in that situation. Right, going, man, we thought Jesus was the Messiah. We thought he was the one that was going to deliver us and the one that has been promised and, and that we would be in this place of freedom coming. And now he's going to the cross and he's, he's dead. Right, and they're hopeless and they're just seeing that moment. Right? But from our perspective, right, we get to step back. We, man, God was absolutely working. Even when Jesus went to the cross, God was working. When Jesus was in the grave, God was working. Right? Because we know the third day right, that God raised him from the dead to bring life, to bring forgiveness, to bring hope. Right? Again, for, for Hannah, right, in a time going, God, where are you? And, and when are you going to work? And when are you going to come through? God did come through eventually. Right, in his timing, and in a way that made it no longer just about her, but her willingness to be yielded to him and to the, the things that, that mattered to God. Let's keep reading verse 21. So they, she'd been given the son Samuel. She names him, man, God hears us when we pray. This reminder, God is alive. He's, he's attentive. He cares. Well, the next year, Elkanah and his family went on their annual trip to offer a sacrifice to the Lord and to, to keep his vow. But Hannah did not go. She told her husband, wait until the boy is weaned, then I will take him to the tabernacle and leave him there with the Lord permanently. Whatever you think is best, Elkanah agreed. Stay here for now and may the Lord help you keep your promise. So she stayed home and nursed the boy until he was weaned. And when the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh and they brought along a three-year-old bull for the sacrifice and a basket of flour and some wine. And after sacrificing the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I am the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. And I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. And now I'm giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worshiped the Lord there. Right after Hannah has Samuel, and she decides right, to stay back from the annual trip to go and, and worship God, and she's going to help uh, right, raise Samuel until he's weaned and is able to, to go on his own. And I love that, that Elkanah maybe has grown a little bit as a husband, where he's just like, hey, yeah, whatever you think is best, I'm hearing your perspective. I'm valuing what you're having to say, but I'm praying that you will, you will stay true to what you promised to God, that you'll stick to that vow. And she does that, right? She is a, a woman of character, a woman that trusts God, that she comes through, right? I can, can't imagine how tempting it would have been, right? There's no indication yet, right, that she has any other kid. She's waited years to bring Samuel. She went years not able to have kids, and she still continues to come and bring him to the Lord. Right, I kind of imagine even being one of her friends where you're going, man, this, this child is your hope uh, of your care in your old age. And you're going to do what? You're going to take him to the Lord? I'm sure they were like, well, I'm sure God would understand your difficult circumstance and you don't have to be faithful to the vow that you made. No, she, she right, God's uh, perspective is more important and she chooses him. And as we move into chapter two, we see a little bit of, of her heart. What's going on in her as she's, she's coming through on, on her promise, she's bringing her son so in verse 1, it says, And Hannah prayed, My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Right? Now, I wasn't my own strength. Right? The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies, and I rejoice because you, God, have rescued me. No one is holy like the Lord. There was no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. So stop acting so proud and haughty. Don't speak with such arrogance, for the Lord is a God who knows what you have done, and he will judge your actions. Right in her, like giving up of her son, of this, this gift that she had so desired God to, to give, 
when she received it, right? She didn't hold on to it. She didn't cling to that. No, she continued to trust God and gave her son to the Lord. And in that, she worshiped and celebrated God and saw God working in her life. Even jumping down to verse nine towards the end of of her prayer, she says, and he will protect his faithful ones, but the wicked will disappear in darkness. No one will succeed by strength alone. Right, in her journey, she realized she was not the solution to her problem. Her husband was not the solution to her problem. Right, God is the one that provided. Maybe a reminder for us, the difficulties and challenges that we're facing you are not the solution, right? There is no other person that is that solution for you other than God. God might use other people. He might use you, but the source of all of that is God. And I love that she describes that. It's it's about what God is doing, how great God is. And then she has this encouragement to, to quit our arrogance, quit pride, like choose humility, so often in our culture right now is when it comes to, to being a woman, right, there's this encouragement like, like, I am woman, hear me roar is often this encouragement for women to kind of to rise up and just like to prove yourself. And I love that Hannah, in her difficult circumstance, in a difficult time, when, right, when things, when people are, are making judgments and they're wondering about God's activity in her life, she doesn't say, hey, I am woman and see me roar. She's like, no, I am woman and look at my God. And watch him roar and watch him do things in my life that are far greater than I can imagine. All right, so women, man, be God's kind of woman. Walk in humility. Have that inner strength and that dignity to endure the circumstance and to, to point back to God. Right, I, I love it, Hannah's example for us that she doesn't give in to her circumstance or the, that difficulty and we get to see God blessing her. Right? And again, the, the time frame wasn't what she wanted, but we see God's blessing. As we continue on, jumping down to verse 18, it says that Samuel, though he was only a boy, he served the Lord and he wore a linen garment like the other priests. And each year his mother made a small coat for him and brought it to him when she came with, with her husband for the sacrifice. Before they would return home, Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, may the Lord give you other children to take the place of this one she gave to the Lord. And the Lord blessed Hannah and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Right, we see that, that her character stays consistent, right? Even though, right, she had that time of, of anguish and questioning, God, where are you? And prayed this very specific prayer and this promise to God. And then she did her part, right? She offered up her son. And again, we have no indication that she gets, kid, gets pregnant right away again. Right? Very likely could have continued to struggle with infertility. And we see that they had this habit of coming year after year, continuing to worship God. Right? And she's kind of making the next size of coat as, as Samuel's growing as a boy. Right? She's bringing it to him and, and, and checking in, seeing how he's doing. And then Eli the priest is praying for him that they would have children. And then eventually, right, they do. And God bless it, right? Three sons. She just asked for one. God, just give me a son, and I'll give him back. And God not only gave her a son, which she did her part and gave it back, but then God gave her more. I think this is a reminder for our God is good, that he desires to work in our life. But Hannah was able to get to the place so that her her life and her priority wasn't just about her and what she would get out of it, but it was about God. Thinking about at the beginning of this story, when we meet these, these two wives, kind of their contrast, right? Penny and I had children, and Hannah did not. And it seems like at the beginning, the one that would have the, the most blessing and the biggest impact would be Penny and I, not Hannah. But by the end, in her a willingness to, to have open hands and to, to yield her life to the Lord, right? She ha- has multiple children, but that child that she yields to the Lord, Samuel, right? Samuel becomes a, a leader of the people a prophet that God would use to, to bring a, a deliverance and help set up uh, the kings and, and represent and get the nation to a place of, of health and, and prioritizing God. Right? And her willingness to not hold on to God's answer right, proved to be a blessing to many. Right? So often in our lives when we're praying and asking God to come through, whether even it could be, God, we need this job or we need this finance or we need this relationship. And once God does it, we often just latch on to that answer rather than latching on to the one that gave the answer. The reality is, right, if, if we put our hope 
and the, and the gifts that God gives us, they eventually lead to death. That's what the book of Judges is all about. When the people just prioritize God's blessing and not God, they get to a place of chaos and death. It's just a reminder for us that how do we be a people that as God blesses, we have open hands. And then we don't hold on to these things. That it's, it's not about this stuff. It's about God and what he's doing and how he wants to, to use us to help others see how good he is, how worthy he is of our lives. I want to read this passage in, in Ephesians 3 as we're getting ready to, to wrap up here. In Ephesians 3, Paul's praying for the church in Ephesus, and he's just really encouraging them to, to just have their lives be about God and his love, to, to see how God wants to work and the, and the blessings of God that aren't just about, they're not about physical things, but it's really about God. He says this in verse 16. He says, I pray that from his, right, from God's glorious and unlimited resources that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him and your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should how, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Our God is good. And again, you might be finding yourself in a, in a challenging spot, a difficulty. Maybe people are, are having some judgments about why you're there. Maybe you're even questioning, God, God, do you even see me? Do you notice? God, how many years do I have to endure? When will you show up? I love that, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I love that he has it recorded of how he's had to interact with people throughout time and his interaction with Hannah, that he saw her in her trial and in her difficulty and blessed her as she was willing to yield her life to be about the things of God. So what do we do with this? And one thing, maybe you're here today and you haven't yet made that decision to surrender your life to God. I want to encourage you to do that. God is good. He made you on purpose to be in relationship with him and to be a part of what he's doing in this world. He is a real God. He really does interact with people. He so desires a personal relationship with you. That's why he sent Jesus. In a moment, we're going to be taking communion together. It's this reminder that, that God sent Jesus to come to this earth to live a sinless life to show us what it looks like to, to be in right relationship with God, to, to trust God, even in the midst of difficulty and trial, but God is greater. And there's life and there's forgiveness. So again, if you haven't made that decision, I want to encourage you, to, today would be that day. Surrender your life to God. And for those of us that have made that decision, maybe some good reminders for us as we read this passage and see how God is interacting. One is this reminder that that facing trial and difficulty is normal for the people of God. It doesn't mean God doesn't like you. And his delay in answering your prayers doesn't mean he is judging you. But he is wanting you to get to the place where your, your hands are open. That your prayers aren't about you, but they're about him and how he wants to use you in his kingdom. And maybe you're already there. Maybe it's still a time where he's just saying, wait, not yet. Have hope. God hears. He sees you. Maybe for us too, it's just a reminder that we need to slow down when it comes to, to judging other people's circumstances and what's going on in their life. That maybe let's not be like Eli that just jumped to conclusions or, or the, the people that would be judging Hannah. No, let's be a people that are, are prayerful and curious and Represent the Lord well as we engage. Right, we want to continue to be a people that pray, a people that have hope, a people that endure, a people that are a part of what God is doing. Right, that we would be a people of strength and dignity. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for you. 
Grateful that you love us, God. Grateful that you are on your throne. Grateful that we can surrender our lives to you and trust you and, and to know that you're working even when we don't see it and we question it and we wonder. God, thank you have a, a bigger and a better perspective. Help us to trust you. Help us to encourage each other to trust you and look to you. Find our hope in you to be a part of what you're doing in this world. We love you, God, and we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.